Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode and today on Hot La Mode we are going to be reviewing and analyzing Alexander McQueen's Autumn Winter 1998 collection titled Joan. And seeing as how it's one of the creepiest McQueen collections to actually exist, it seems like the perfect time to talk about it. <laughs> Before we get any further into the video though, if you guys are looking for a channel that talks about fashion in the most fun, sassy, bitchy, analytical way, this is it. So you can go down below, hit the subscribe button and turn on my post notifications. I mean like, what do you have to lose? You're already here. And if you guys want to see more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Hot Mode. I post some pretty pop and fashion memes and my Instagram stories always have the fashion news and gossip you need to know. And if you want to see even more from me, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Hot Mess. I post more of my personal opinions and outfits. So enjoy. So this is a bit of a new series, but it's one that I plan to do monthly because I feel like you guys would enjoy it as it definitely get like the fashion show lovers going. Like essentially every month we're going to be reviewing one iconic, interesting, or super important fashion show that we've never talked about here. And seeing as how it's around Halloween and that's spooky and scary and spoopy, I thought it was important that we talk about a McQueen show. Now, as you guys probably already know, I have done two videos on the top 10 McQueen shows to know. But in reality, those videos are like only scraping the surface. There's so many iconic McQueen shows that I haven't talked about yet. And I feel like this one titled Joan, which is the 1998 on a winter collection is so important, so iconic it must be discussed. Now from the title, you may have some idea about who the show was actually named after, and it was none other than the historical figure, Joan of Arc. Now, Joan of Arc is a canonized saint, and while she might have seemed holier than thou, she was doing some quite scandalous things, especially considering she lived during the 15th century. And personally, I feel like this is the reason that Lee McQueen easily got caught up in the whole Joan experience. Lee explained in an interview that the reason why he was inspired by Joan of Arc was actually because while he was the creative director of Givenchy from 1996 to 2001, he often would walk by the statue titled Jean d'Arc. I'm embracing the Frenchness of this channel now. And so essentially he would see the Jean d'Arc statue in Paris. He would walk by it every day and he felt like, hmm, Joan of Arc, who's that? Let me educate myself. And so he did. And considering Lee loved the gory details of everything, him and Joan are kind of like a match made in heaven, except he's gay and she was a virgin. So yeah, maybe not. Before we talk about the actual collection, I do feel like it's important we talk a little bit about Joan herself, seeing as how I didn't really know a lot about her. And I feel like all of you probably would do really, really badly on a Joan of Arc trivia challenge. So Joan of Arc was a young girl who was born in Dohem, France, excuse the French absolute slaughter of pronunciation. And she was born a few years after the Hundred Years War, which really kicked off in 1412. Her parents are often said to have been poor and she did grow up with a very devout Christian mother. Her mother instilled in her quite prominent morals and Joan hung around as a child mostly with animals and really became a very, very good seamstress, which seems like a fun little quirky tidbit, you know, considering McQueen was also a very good seamster. Now the Hundred Years War is important as well, but I'm not gonna like do a whole thing about that, but pretty much really quick, simple, not super historically accurate synopsis is that England and France were fighting over whether or not a king of mixed blood, AKA British and French, should inherit the thrones of both countries. The English were all like, yes, because they were in control of the person that was supposed to become the king. But the French were all like, ha, we are no, we are good. So the English obviously got mad and they aligned with the Burgundians who were pretty much the Belgians now. Like, and this was all while the French elected their own king, even though France wasn't actually united whatsoever. At an unknown age, Joan started to have these visions and they were very vivid. Essentially, she thought that angels and saints were talking to her. Okay. After a while, the visions got stronger and stronger to the point where they were calling her to go to this commander of the French army. And while she was there, she was like asking that this commander give her horses and men so that she could go see Charles VII, 
who essentially was the king chosen by the French people. At first the commander was like, who are you again? But eventually he saw that all the other like little townspeople where he was were believing in her story. So he was kind of like, all right. And she pretty much was saying that she was going to save France from being controlled by the British. So he kind of was like, all right, well, you know, I guess I'm gonna do this. So Joan got her horses and her men and essentially she was like, ooh, uh, this is really treacherous and scary. So what I'm gonna do is cut off all of my hair so people think I'm a man. And she had this really weird, ugly bob. And then she started wearing armor and like men's clothing, which was like not really okay at the time. It was actually like super controversial because women were not allowed to wear men's clothing. Literally, it was like in the Bible, it was super illegal. Like, you know how the early Europeans are about their biblical laws. So in reality, Joan wearing men's clothing, not great. This also happens to be the place where Lee actually began his story for the show. The first look was this beautiful chainmail cowl neck dress which was an obvious reference to Joan's wearing of armor, but it had this like backless cowl that draped right to above the ass, which is like so McQueen. The chainmail was quite shiny and was sheer up close. And you could see the model's breasts and underwear, which was signature Lee McQueen. He was always one to bear it for fashion. Then came a gown in the same shiny chainmail. The model had a matching chainmail hood, which wasn't as masculine as traditional and historical hoods. Instead, the model's hood is draped in a way that creates a longer back and almost hair-like qualities, making it much more feminine than the traditional hoods. The gown is also transparent in the light, and when the model turns around, it shows that the dress in fact has a large cutout in the skirt portion, obviously to help the model walk, but also, you know, is a little bit provocative and very McQueeny. Now, let's be real. Joan was very prudish. As she wanted to remain a virgin for God, I respect it, live your best life. So in reality, she literally would have looked at McQueen's collections and probably like spit on them. But also at the same time, I like to see this juxtaposition of the super pious Joan and the super like vulgar and like sexual Lee McQueen. Next came a shimmering sequin coat with gray slacks. On the coat is an image of the Romanov children who were heirs to the Tsar of Russia. McQueen was also inspired by the deaths of the family and had their images printed all over the coats and tops, which then had clear sequins sewn on top, which gave them that very shimmery quality as the light hit them. McQueen had actually done this two years before with his Dante collection, where he used Don McCullen's photography with graphic images from the Vietnam War, but he got in trouble for copyright use, which could be why he used the Romanov's images instead, as the photos probably didn't have copyright claims on them. Then came another coat with a clean tailored fit, which showcased Lee's time as an apprentice on Savile Row. Savile Row, for those of you who do not know, is essentially a street in London where the best tailors in the city, the country, almost the world essentially hang out and create their creations. And that's why you see a lot of very sharp tailoring that is super severe because he really does have experience and knows the inner workings of creating tailored garments. The collar is high and the shoulders are super sharp as well. But the interesting thing is Lee had the models wear these bright red contacts. The use of the colored contacts that created quite menacing figures was uncommon at the time, and it was supposedly based on the cover of The Face magazine, which Nick Knight had shot with Lee on the cover. The issue did come out in April of 1998 and probably was shot like two or three months in advance, so it made sense. But I also wonder, could the contacts have been a reference to Joan of Arc's very, very vivid visions? Then came a simple gray coat, which would be an easy and commercial piece that buyers could easily sell to customers. But the expert tailoring and large event, AKA the technical term for the slit up the back of the coat, showcased the model wearing nothing but nude panties. Lee might have been doing commercial pieces, but let's be real, he was gonna make them cheeky. The chainmail rolled back around, this time in an off the shoulder style. It isn't spectacular, but the way that the back of the dress stretches the arms back looks super uncomfortable, especially after a long time wearing it. Was this McQueen's way of showing how clothing and gender has tortured women throughout the ages? I don't know, but honestly, like that shit looks like it really would hurt. Then came a menswear look featuring the Romanoff prints with the clear sequins, reinstating the morbid atmosphere of the collection. I mean, listen, dead children killed because of their royal family's mistakes definitely is a downer even for me. Then came a black caped top and leather pants accessorized with metal armor. The look is extremely reminiscent of Thierry Mugler's robot suit from his Autumn Winter 1995 collection. And Mugler and McQueen both shared the same sentiments on fashion as theater. There is a helmet with widow's peak, 
shoulder pads that extend down the arms but don't cover them fully, and these connected sharp finger gloves. Then came a gray suit in what looks like linen with a little capelet. To me, it resembles a pellegrina, which is a short cape that hangs on the shoulders of garments. You may have seen it on like Catholic clergy members like the Pope, but I've also found images of it being worn during the Victorian era, which was a favorite reference point of Lee. Then came a halter neck version of the Romanov printed sequin style, but it was on a male model. The halter was backless as well, showing that even as early as 1997, the queen was bending gender in a way that is only being normalized today. Then came another simple tailored menswear look, as McQueen at this point in his career was becoming London's commercial and artistic juggernaut. Lee's shows were the hottest ticket of London Fashion Week and could have even been the hottest ticket of the entirety of Fashion Month. He had also found success with his collection Dante two years earlier, and it seemed Lee realized that his smart and masterful tailoring was an easy selling point for both men and women. Then came a mock neck dress that was very interestingly constructed. My eye is drawn to the center of the dress where a tight waist is created and is a barrier between the top and skirt. The skirt is long and sexy while the back has buttons all the way up the dress. The top has an excess of fabric as well that could be wearable for more bustier women. So like was Lee trying to, you know, diversify his portfolio Leo and palette? I don't know. But also another point to bring up is Lee's time at Givenchy actually taught him a lot more about draping and how to just be more stereotypically feminine. So who knows? At this point, we should talk about the hair from the show as well, as it definitely is jarring. It was done by the now famed hairstylist Guido Palau, who was working on his first McQueen collection at this time. He mentions in an interview that he recalls Lee saying something about raised hairlines, which is why so many of the models have these very severe haircuts. He mentions that his work for the collection really was an evolution, and that he tried to mix medieval styles and futurism. And seeing as how Joan had a bob, which was quite a masculine haircut for the time, this severe style makes a lot of sense. A black and white printed skirt suit descended upon the runway, this time accessorized with a tighter red crystal encrusted hood. Deborah Shaw, the model who had worn the cage in his most recent collection, La Poupée, had garnered herself and McQueen quite a lot of attention for the quite controversial performance. But here she is in a quite tight and harsh skirt suit that has one strange lump on the side of the skirt. I assume it was intentional considering that it was Lee who was actually, you know, looking at every single garment that went down his runway. And he really was heavily involved in everything because normally he was the one that was cutting and slashing and doing all of these things in fittings, which was very different from how many other designers worked then and still work now. We get quite a few more tailored looks, one with this beautiful open lapel in burgundy leather, maybe a reference to burgundy, burgundy, the burgundians. And another was a beautiful burgundy coat dress with high collar. It felt mystical, almost like something a supervillain would wear, which feels like all McQueen collections, but you know. McQueen also started to show these beautiful quilted pieces they were obviously tailored and quite fitted, which is nice to see from a fabric that is usually oversized and swallows the wearer. Then we get a slew of highly tailored and military inspired pieces, which is a perfect segue back into Joan of Arc my favorite cross-dresser. After having donned her new bob haircut and men's attire, she began crusading in the name of Charles VII. Eventually her and Chucky Boy met and he was like, I'm gonna wear like peasant clothes and she's never gonna know who I am. But she was like, I'm having a vision. And essentially was like, bam, Chuck, what's up? And like pointed at him, was talking to him. And so he was like, all right, guess maybe I should like talk to this lady. Charles eventually agreed to let the 17 year old girl go with him to this battle in Orleans where the English had control of the city. Joan actually was never involved in any of the fighting, but she more so was there for like moral support and she was a really great battle strategist. So essentially they had this battle at Orleans and everybody was like, oh my God, the French are gonna lose. But then after three days, the French were like, ah, bitch, we won. So they beat the British and it was like really absolutely unexpected. So then later Joan, who everybody should have been listening to said to Charles, hey, Chuck, what's up? You should go to this place called Reem and you should be crowned the king. And Charles was all like, oh, I don't know. He's such a bitch boy. But eventually he did it and he became king of France. And then he was like, Joan, whatever, like do your thing, go crusading, go hang out with, you know, whoever you want, beat the British. So about a year later, Joan is battling at this place called Compigny. 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 This is my heart. This is the hardest French word. Compigny. Compigny. 
Compion, Compongine, whatever. And essentially outside of the gates of this city that was controlled by the Burgundians, she got shot with an arrow. The Burgundians kind of captured her and then the Burgundians were also allied with the British. And so they kind of were like, hey, we'll sell Joan back to you for ransom money. And Charles was all like, he was good, he didn't, he, he said no. Which leads us back into this McQueen collection. There was a section of crochet dresses, pants, and sweaters that came down the runway as well. While they weren't revolutionary, it showed that McQueen was unafraid of trying different fabrics and garment styles. Then the striped men's halter neck apron with black leather gloves was really making me feel some type of way. Mostly about whether or not I could actually pull off a halter. Then a shiny red dress with this long swinging fringe channeled a very stark seductive attitude. This dress had two other renditions, one with clear lines running throughout and another in black and red with a sexier neckline and hood. These felt far too sexy to be Joan of Arc for me, but it also could have been a reference to the sex workers that used to like follow Joan's army around who she used to like swat away with a sword. And then we started to see a lot of feathers and tartans, all in black and red. The tartan was a signature McQueen trope and an ode to his Scottish heritage who also happened to hate the English. The famous McQueen bumpsters obviously made a comeback in an array of styles from tartan to striped, to glitter, to patent leather. One striped pair was styled with a black crop top that had connected sleeves that created a train of their own. Highly unfunctionable, but highly fashionable. As the collection began to wear down, we saw a red lace cocktail dress that covered the model's face. You may recognize the look as it was worn by collaborator and friend of Lee, Lady Gaga. Gaga wore the look at the 2009 Video Music Awards where she performed one of her most controversial performances to date, where she essentially died on stage. If that's not a Gaga and McQueen, you know, good ass time, I don't know what is. Now we probably should talk a little bit more about Joan of Arc before we get into the finale of the show. Since Chuck would not pay for Joan to be ransomed back to him, the British were like, mm, we don't wanna deal with this. So the British army was like, here British clergy, we'll give you Joan. And the British clergy were like super annoying and had nothing to do, so they were like, hmm, we'll bring her up on 70 charges from heresy to witchcraft. Imagine having nothing better to do than just bring somebody up on 70 different charges. It's a lot of paperwork. Throughout multiple interrogations, she claimed her innocence and piety, but also she was not actually placed in a religious prison, which is usually like guarded by nuns. She was actually placed in an army prison, which was guarded by male guards. Essentially, it said that Joan was forced to sign this document that said that she wouldn't actually wear men's clothing anymore and that if she did, she'd be murdered by them. So there's that. But many also believe that because Joan was actually a woman and the fact that she grew up in a very rural town, she probably didn't know how to read. So she probably didn't actually know what she was signing. Now, I also just wanna say this part can be like a little bit triggering. I just wanna prepare everybody for this. It's also been reported that Joan's guards at her prison often would threaten her with rape, which she was terrified of as one of the most important things to her was staying a virgin. And also like, I can't imagine just being threatened with rape. After signing the legal documents, it's reported that she was given women's clothing, but essentially maybe like two or three days later, the guards ripped them off and said that she could either be naked or she could just wear men's clothing. And she didn't want to be raped or anything of the sort. So she opted instead to wear men's clothing. And then when the clergy members found her wearing men's clothing, they were like, we're gonna kill you. And it's like very aggressive and I don't really know why. Like why, why are we so hateful to Joan? She's just freeing France from British control. And so on May 30th, 1431, Joan was burned at the stake. And so after she perished in the flames, the British essentially burned her body two more times because they didn't want any of the people like taking little artifacts or like trophies. So essentially they took all the ashes from Joan's body and just kind of like threw them in the Seine. And so now people are saying that like Joan's ashes like, you know, ride through the Seine to this day, which is a nice thought. This was the ending of Joan's life, but it also was the perfect ending for a McQueen collection. So when a masked red fringe clad model skulked down the runway, it meant something was about to happen. The swinging lights above dimmed and the model stood there for a second in the darkness. And like Joan herself on her last day, the model was surrounded by flames as she felt her bare thighs and the heat. It was almost a calming thing, definitely not like the horror and agony Joan would have faced, 
but it might have caused some financial agony for Lee as it was reportedly one of the most expensive shows he'd ever done. But also like financial troubles, like getting burned at the stake, like, you know, they don't really compare. But Lee also didn't really seem to care much about finances because in reality, he wanted to leave the viewer with a real story. Something that just wasn't a throwaway idea. He wanted to leave you with something that would actually last as he believed in the idea of longevity for fashion. Clothing should not just be thrown away or turned into trends like the fashion establishment did and still does. Dragon all y'all fashion people watching this video. And then Lee and his stylist and good friend, Katie England, came down the runway. Lee had his bleach blonde hair and red contacts in, which was very similar to all of the models. And they descended the runway walking to the song Bye Baby by Diana Ross, which is like very sad. And it's all about like saying goodbye, which like we're saying goodbye to Joan of Arc. Like, thank you so much for your time. And then Lee and Katie had this cute little like kiss on the lips and then the show was over. Overall, this is a McQueen show whose visuals have gone down in history and in more than one way. McQueen's idea of actually getting fashion to mean something more than just a price tag is why he is so great and his Joan collection is a perfect example of why he is a fashion legend. Now that is the end of the video. Honestly, I kind of love this series and I'm going to make it a thing I do every month. So if you love these kinds of videos, please suggest some shows in the comments down below that you want me to talk about. Obviously I will, you know, put them in a list and I'll start doing them. And I want them to be like fun and themed though. You know what I mean? So that is it for the video. I'd love to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Please let me know. Do you love McQueen collections? Do you feel like they're too crazy, too over the top? So many people think that he's like a devil worshiper. Like I don't believe all of that but okay yeah that's the end of the video thank you guys so much for watching i will see you guys on the next one and tt y l